question, I promise uh, we'll get to do a little bit of a pee break. Um, so Tom, you're gonna jump in first, then we're gonna go to your video and something like that. Yeah, so I'll give a little bit of an introduction, maybe, maybe 10 minutes or so, and then if we can jump into the video and then for the final 10 minutes or so, I've got a few extra slides on the new cultivars and then time for questions if, if, if it allows. Please. Perfect. All right, well, uh, take it away. All right, so I, sh I can share my screen. Uh, yep. Okay, let me uh, find my presentation here. Okay, well, first of all, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to speak today at the NOFA Winter Conference. This is really exciting. It's been a few years since I, I talked at a NOFA conference and we've had we've had some, some big things in the hazelnut breeding program since then. So it's really, really great to be able to, to speak with you today. Um, so I, I kind of added to my title here of my presentation, hazelnuts, uh, a tasty and sustainable addition to the food landscape of the Eastern United States. Um, so I'm kind of going to go through a little bit of an introduction about hazelnuts. I know some of you have maybe seen me speak before about hazelnuts, but maybe it's new to some others. So I'll give a little bit of an introduction on kind of why do we have a hazelnut breeding program at Rutgers, talk a little bit about the hazelnut plant itself, and then that should lead us up into this really, really nice video uh, that NOFA New Jersey helped put together uh, on the hazelnut program that I think will be real informative. And then after that, we'll come back talk a little bit about the new cultivars we released and then hopefully have some, some time for questions. So this program here goes all the way back to 1996 and I can't really talk about hazelnuts without, uh, even till this day, it's been over 20, it's been more than 22, 23 years. Um, I can't really give a presentation on hazelnuts without bringing up Dr. Reed Funk, who was turf grass breeder at Rutgers University. He had a really incredible career as turf grass breeder. That program is still going strong today. Uh, really revolutionary in terms of breeding perennial ryegrass, tall fescue, fine fescues, um, and many of the, the turf grasses you may purchase at a regular Home Depot or Lowe's today comes from some of Dr. Fung's breeding and continues. Uh, but in the, in the late 1990s, when he was nearing retirement, he started to really think about food crops and, and sustainable food. And ever since he was a young child, he had a love of walnut trees, black walnuts, uh, Persian or English walnuts, and he read J. Russell Smith's Tree Crops to Permanent Agriculture as a, as a young person, and it really inspired him. So as he was nearing retirement, he decided, well, I'm not gonna retire. I'm just gonna retire from turf grasses, and then I'm gonna start this ambitious tree breeding project. This was in 1996, and I was very lucky to be a freshman in college at the time, and I wanted to work in, in plant breeding and plant science, and I met Dr. Funk, and uh, basically never stopped working on trees since that day. Um, the idea wasn't hazelnuts at the beginning, it was actually uh, temperate nut species. What we really wanted to do was is screen through all these possible nut species we could grow in New Jersey, uh, in the mid-Atlantic region, in the Northeast, and, and see which, which ones really had the most opportunity. Uh, so this included nuts that I think most of you would be familiar with, like black walnuts, Persian walnuts, um, but also heart nuts, which is a Japanese species. Um, also pecans, hickories, chestnut, almonds, pistachios, ginkgos, and hazelnuts. So we, I was so fortunate at the time I got to help Dr. Funk amass this collection of over 30,000 trees. Uh, so over, over about a 10 year period, we did a lot of germplasm collection and we had this opportunity to plant all these different nut species across Rutgers properties. And of course, Dr. Funk was so successful previously, awesome. everyone just kind of let him go ahead and, 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 and do this. Uh, any piece of land that was not being used, we planted nut trees on. And the idea here was really to identify the tree species that showed the greatest potential for New Jersey. And then once we did that, create a very targeted breeding program with the goal to create new high yielding cultivars, uh, with, but with the idea of low input in mind. So reduced inputs on pesticides, fungicides, man management, et cetera. Um, and I can talk about that for a long time, what we went through and how we've kind of settled on what we did. Um, but for the sake of time, uh, really hazelnuts stood out early, uh, really, really quite quickly as the candidate that would have the most uh, likeliness for substantial improvement. And, and really this is simply put, they were very well adapted to New Jersey in general. 
these were the first species to really start out of all those different nut species. These produced nuts at an earlier age and they had almost no pests or disease problems, uh, at least in the early stages, um, minus one really major devastating disease, uh, which we'll talk a little bit about today, but not, not a whole lot, um, but Eastern filbert blight. So Eastern filbert blight was really the primary reason there's not been European hazelnuts grown commercially in the Eastern United States in the past. Uh, but we realized that if we could develop Eastern filbert blight resistance or find it and use it in a successful breeding program, we could actually create a new industry uh, in the eastern United States. Uh, these, these trees just grow so well here. Uh, so in 2006, we really got away from a lot of the other nut species and, and hazelnuts became the main focus of the breeding program. And here, just to kind of give a little bit of the background for those that might not be interested or have experience with hazelnuts, commercial production is based on the European hazelnut, which is Corylus avalana. Um, it's been called the hazelnut or the filbert. Um, there's 13 total species in this genus, and you may be familiar with our Corylus americana. So we do have a native American hazelnut. You can even find it rarely nowadays, but you can still find it even in New Jersey. Uh, the problem with that species, it, it, it produces tiny nuts with thick shells, and they're very shrubby. So it's not really a commercially uh, styled plant, um, although it's a nice backyard plant, a nice wildlife plant, so has a lot of nice traits, but it's really not a commercial producer especially when you compare it to the European hazelnut or, or cultivars of the European hazelnut. Uh, it is the fifth most important tree nut crop in the world. It gets up to around uh, 1 million metric tons per year. And this is, of course, behind cashews, almonds, walnuts, and chestnuts. It's really similar in production to pistachio, uh, at least currently. And the United States uh, only produces about 4 to 5% of this total. Uh, what's amazing with hazelnuts, around 70% of the world's crop is grown in Turkey. Uh, so that's a major, major player when it comes to world production. And about 15% is in, in, in Italy, uh, where, of course, hazelnuts are a, a major crop. Uh, lesser amounts are grown in Chile, the Republic of Georgia. Over the past 10 years, production has really expanded in China, but there's also production in France, Spain, and you can find it growing all across Eastern and Northern Europe. Uh, what's most important, I think, or something to highlight at this point, though, is the current demand for hazelnuts worldwide cannot be met with the avail available supply. Uh, so hazelnuts have become like one of the it nuts, especially on the culinary side. And, and I'll talk a little bit about that uh, in a second. Um, and then because of this sort of supply and demand issue with hazelnuts, production is expanding worldwide. So if you go through Eastern Europe, you'll see these large thousand acre plantings going in in places like Romania, Serbia, it's increasing in Italy, Germany, you can see plantings even in South Africa and Australia, and of course, like I mentioned, China. Um, even in the United States, production has doubled over the past 10 years uh, in Oregon, the Willamette Valley. So I should note that 99% of the US production is in the Willamette Valley of Oregon. And really the remaining 1% is just across the border in Washington state. There, there's very little commercial production uh, comparatively anywhere outside of the Pacific Northwest. But that is changing. Um, today, there are multiple product projects underway to develop more widely adapted hazelnuts to expand the range of production. And I know some of you out there uh, joining us today are probably familiar with some of these organizations. Um, I'm part of the Hybrid Hazelnut Consortium. This is Rutgers, Oregon State, University of Nebraska, Nebraska Arbor Day, and the University of Missouri. And we've really teamed up to try to develop a much more widely adapted um, hazelnut these tend to be hybrid hazelnuts, not pure European, like what we are lucky we can grow in New Jersey. Uh, and then of course, in an even colder region, we've got the upper Midwest hazelnut development initiative. Uh, so there's a lot going on in the world with hazelnuts right now. So it's, it's very exciting, uh, especially when I started uh, in 1996 with Dr. Funk, uh, a lot of this just wasn't happening. And we had the Oregon State Breeding Program and they weren't really, they were focused on their industry and not looking towards how they can help other places. Uh, I'd like to mention the crop. If you're not familiar with hazelnuts, I, I bet most people are at this time, especially from products like Nutella. Uh, but from the breeding perspective, it's important to know where are those nuts headed? What, what's the qualities we need to look for? Uh, so here we have 93% of the world's crop is used as kernels and candies, baked goods, and other confectionery products. Today, only about 7% are sold as those large in-shell nuts uh, for home cracking. And I remember as a kid, 
we we did a lot more of that during sort of Thanksgiving through the holidays. You sit around and you crack nuts, and 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 it's really not it's not really happening as much as it used to. Uh, but hazelnuts are, like I mentioned, really becoming coveted in all these different crops uh, or products that they can um, be be used in to enhance the flavors. Um, and another really important point I should make here: most hazelnuts consumed in the United States are imported. Uh, so as you're thinking about crops you can grow and thinking about supply and demand, uh, most of the hazelnuts that we eat are essentially coming from, from Turkey. Um, just a snapshot of all these great products that are, are tasty products, I should say, uh, with hazelnuts. I, of course, track this every time I go in the store. I'm always looking for a new, new chocolate or candy or ice cream with hazelnuts in them. And there's just so many of them. Um, but besides this, we can also look at uh, be beyond the processed foods, there is a demand for local, fresh, high quality kernels, uh, for direct snacking, fresh roasted hazelnuts are incredibly tasty, uh, but also in restaurant use, healthy value added products, um, these potential seem very high. So making locally grown organic hazelnut butter, for example, uh, that's, that's sort of hard to find at this point in time. Um, we do have some kind of interesting success stories with hazelnuts. Uh, we've been selling nuts from our farm, from our research farm for about four or five years now, just trying to test the market, get these nuts out to, to chefs and candy makers. Uh, and we have this Rutgers connected chef, uh, Dan Richer, who owns Raza and uh, Pizzeria in Jersey City. And he's actually become quite popular recently or the restaurant, um, even that you can see this New York Times article is New York's best pizza in New Jersey. Um, in that article, they mention a pizza they actually make with hazelnuts. Uh, I know it sounds a little bit crazy, but I have a picture of it there. Uh, and it's just the, the most tasty thing ever uh, combined with this really nice crust that he developed uh, or the nice dough. Um, you've got hazelnuts, uh, a, a really fresh ricotta cheese and honey, and it's just been a huge seller. And Chef Dan already this year has probably purchased about 500 pounds of hazelnut kernels from us just for these pizzas and some other things he makes in the restaurant. So it's, it's quite exciting when you get these fresh hazelnuts in the hands of creative people. And here's just one other example I wanted to show. Um, we've been working with Shane Confectionery in Philadelphia and just look at this beautiful candy bar that they've made uh, with their own chocolate that they make. They have a, a team of chocolatiers and then our, our Rutgers farm grown hazelnuts. Um, just, just some of the exciting things you can do with hazelnuts. Um, so before I get into the production of the crop and we move to the video, I just wanted to also talk a little bit about the tree itself. So if you're considering hazelnuts as something you may grow in the, in the future, um, the plant itself, uh, not too different than maybe the pawpaws. If you plant a seed and you just let it grow, it becomes a, a multiple stem shrub uh, in the landscape. And you can actually grow it for production that way, although there's some limitations that we could talk about there. Um, they can be grown as clumps or hedgerows, or they can be pruned and grown like trees in a standard orchard, as you see in the bottom right picture here. Uh, the nuts themselves, um, the beauty of hazelnuts, especially if you have the right cultivars, is they mature in the fall and can either be picked from the tree or allowed to drop and collected from the orchard floor, uh, meaning that they can be highly mechanized in terms of harvest. Um, so, and you'll see a video of that uh, a little bit later. Um, and I should mention also that there has really been limited breeding. Now in the United States, it's a different story over the past 30 or 40 years, but worldwide, uh, that the hazelnut production is based on clonal cultivars, largely of ancient origin. So these are not modern cultivars. These have been around for, for many, many decades, if not hundreds of years. Um, and they're sort of uh, regional, regionally specific grown local cultivars. So it's kind of an interesting scenario especially from the perspective of plant breeding where there's, there's just a ton of genetic diversity out there. And you'll see how that comes into play in one of my, my slides coming up here. Um, I need to mention Turkey because they're such a big player. Like I said, 70% of the world's crop comes from Turkey. And what's quite amazing is those nuts are all picked by hand. Now I said that you can, uh, hazelnuts can be highly mechanized in terms of harvest, uh, but the steep slopes that they're growing on tur in Turkey really mean they uh, it's a different system. They actually grow cultivars with these tight clasping husks, which facilitates hand harvest. Um, and they're grown on these very, very steep slopes. It's quite amazing how steep of the slope uh, they can grow on and still be a successful orchard. 
and they grow them in clumps called ojacks. So they're not pruning them to a single stem or just a few stems like we might do here in the United States. Uh, and just a real quick photo, pretty much all of the vegetation in this picture, these are all hazelnuts. Uh, so in Turkey, it's really become part of the forest. This is in Northern Turkey along the Black Sea. Uh, and that's, if you're eating any hazelnut snacks in the United States, um, this is primarily the system that they're grown in. And although it's not necessarily organic, um, it's very low input. Um, there's very little fertility even added and, and very little pest control. It's, it's really a natural system. The yields are kind of low uh, under these systems, but um, there's very low input. Now, in other places of the world, which would include Oregon, um, you know, the, the Willamette Valley or Italy, Spain and France, uh, they grow cultivars specifically that drop the nuts to the orchard floor so they can be harvested with machines. Uh, this upper picture is a relatively new orchard, probably a five-year-old orchard in Oregon, where they just have laser level fields. They grow the trees in perfect uniformity as single trunks. Uh, but in the bottom picture here, this is a, is a relatively similar aged orchard from Italy, where you can see they're growing not in necessarily a single trunk, but three to five stems uh, with an orchard floor with grass, something more along the lines of what we would do here in New Jersey. Uh, and just the picture here of the the open husks that allow the nuts to fall out at maturity. Um, when I talk about hazelnuts, now I could talk about a number of different aspects of the crop, um, but what I'd like to really point out is they're not a new crop. Uh, they're, they're just new for our region. Uh, so the equipment and the knowledge exists for growing, harvesting, and processing the European hazelnuts. Now, if you're growing the wild American hazelnut or some of the hybrid hazelnuts uh, that have a different growth habit, different um, you know, maturity type. Um, we're not quite there yet, but with the European hazelnut, we can borrow from Oregon, we can borrow from Italy and, and France where they have really modern production. Um, but one thing to point out is when compared to most tree fruit uh, or you know, standard orchard fruit and vegetables, hazelnuts require typically require less input of chemicals and labor. Um, like I said, the highly mechanized harvesting, um, there's limited pruning, there's tends to be limited chemical sprays, um, and what we really hope, or as we look towards the forward, uh, look forward here, is that the disease-resistant cultivars that we're developing at Rutgers and some of our colleagues are developing hold very significant potential for organic production. Uh, so if you're not having to spray for eastern filbert blight, then that really opens the door to producing them with very low chemical inputs. Uh, and just a couple other facts before we go to the video. Um, traditionally or historically, Hazelnut orchards are expected to be very long lived orchards. Um, 35 years would be a young orchard, but 35 to 50 plus years. I've been in many orchards that are 60, 70 years old, still very productive. Um, the trees begin to bear nuts in about three to four years with significant production of about seven or eight, by about seven or eight years. Um, I, I looked at the average yields over Oregon for about 20 years and 2,400 pounds per acre is the average. Uh, but there's some years where it's over 3,500 pounds, getting close to 4,000 pounds per acre. Um, and then as, as you'll see in the video, um, trees are typically planted on about a 20 by 20 spacing, uh, but maybe a little bit closer under a higher density situation. And uh, one of the other critical points here, uh, if you're thinking about hazelnuts, is that maybe we didn't mention in the video, uh, is that site selection is critical. Um, of course, that's probably true for most crops, um, but with the investment that you would put up front with tree crops, uh, really do your homework in terms of site selection. Make sure uh, that you're not in poor drained soil uh, because they will, of course, respond poorly under those situations. Um, they're very tough trees. Uh, once you get them established, they grow quite well, but um, there's certain soil situations where they're problematic. Uh, and the last point before we go to the video, of course, and I could talk for an hour on Eastern filbert blight, uh, but the real reason we haven't been able to grow hazelnuts in a place like New Jersey in the sort of moderated mid-Atlantic re region is Eastern filbert blight. This disease is naturally occurring with our wild American hazelnut. It's widespread across our region uh, and it's quite devastating to the European hazelnut. It's not found in Europe. The European hazelnut uh, in general is highly susceptible. So we bring it here, we try to grow it uh, and it eventually succumbs to this disease. Um, but what we did find and others have found before us that the Euro European species is adapted to our, some of the selections 
some seed types or cultivars of European hazelnut are adapted here. So if we had disease resistance, we could grow that European hazelnut. And that has been the premise of our breeding program uh, early on, find disease resistance, move it into a breeding program, and we would have success in the mid-Atlantic region. Uh, luckily at Rutgers University, we had a very close connection with Oregon State with Dr. Sean Mellenbacher, who's been the hazelnut breeder there since the, the early 1980s. Uh, he helped us in terms of sourcing plant materials for testing. Uh, and we've been planting seedlings and grafted trees since, since way before the year 2000. Um, unfortunately, we found these really great cultivars developed at Oregon State uh, succumb to the strains of the Eastern Filbert Plate fungus we have in New Jersey. And uh, fungicides to keep those trees alive are just way too expensive and not effective. So we, we had to dig deeper to find suitable plants. Uh, so we made some very extensive seed collections and clonal plant collections all over the native range of European hazelnut. Um, some other time I could talk more about that. It was a lot of fun. Uh, but the goal here was just to go back to the, the native range, to the centers of diversity of European hazelnut and search for resistance to Eastern filbert blight. Uh, so throughout the early, early years of the program, we, we imported thousands of seeds, grew many, many trees, and, and Ultimately, we had success. We found disease resistance in European hazelnut, and we were able to use that in the breeding program uh, to get us to where we are today. Uh, so this is a traditional breeding program based on controlled crosses. Uh, luckily, we worked with Oregon State, so we could actually use some of their really elite breeding parents. We would cross them with our new resistant plants. For example, we found a number of resistant plants from, uh, from Russia, from Ukraine, uh, hopefully come with a little added cold hardiness. We go through that process of making controlled crosses, growing out thousands of seedlings. Of course, now with the goal of Eastern filbert blight resistance. Uh, so we would, we would actually infect the trees in the field. Uh, we would look for cankers and create our own epidemics as most of the trees would succumb to disease. Um, and then about year five into that process, uh, and of course, remember we were doing this each year, uh, those that are resistant would still be alive and healthy, and those, of course, that were susceptible would be dead or dying. We would harvest the nuts and go through um, a pretty rigorous evaluation as we were looking for, of course, the right size, shape, uh, shell thickness, flavor of the kernels. We, had a, we have a whole system we go through here. Um, but really what, what I wanted to get to before we go to the video is the current status of the program. Um, our top breeding selections from this program over 20 years were propagated and tested in multiple locations for yield, disease resistance, uh, kernel quality. Um, in just 2020, we released our first cultivars uh, from the program. Uh, so a long process to get to that point, but we did release our first varieties um, just in 2020 and they're now available. Um, 2021 was the first year for significant sales and uh, 2022, there should be quite a bit available for those that are interested. Um, and we made sure to select unrelated plants that express different disease resistance uh, or different sources of resistance. So when you plant your orchard, it's not just protected by one uh, form of resistance that the fungus may quickly overcome. And if we have questions, we can talk about that uh, you know, after, after the video. Um, so I'm not sure if I should click for the video. Um, um, I'll, or... I'll take care of it. So actually, if, if you want to uh, cut your screen share for now. So what we're going to do, we're going to show a, a video that we produced with you and your, your partner. Um, but we're going to actually cut the beginning half off and just go right to the processing point, just because you, you went over a lot of the, the discussion of how to grow. Um, and then if anybody wants to watch the video in its entirety, uh, it'll be on our site and you can watch the whole thing. But for now, uh, you're going to get to watch some really cool processing stuff. So Sounds good. I'm going to add our spotlight here. And here we go. Up, pollen will move down the germ tube and eventually turn into a nut. Hi, my name is Tom Molnar, and I'm responsible for the hazelnut breeding and research program at Rutgers University. Uh, and today we're going we're gonna to look at how we shell hazelnuts, and we'll talk a little bit about the process, and, and we'll demonstrate it so you get a chance to see how the nuts are cracked, and then how they're sorted, and in the end, uh, how we come up with 
I'm getting these nice, tasty, clean hazelnut kernels um, out of their tough shells. So I'd like to just tell you a little bit about this machine. Um, this is not a, you know, a hugely commercial scale sheller. This is really sort of the small farm or very small hazelnut farm sheller. Um, this comes from a company in Northern Italy uh, called Pianchia. Uh, and we're able to import just, we've been able to start importing these machines from Italy. Um, and it's really perfect for uh, maybe like a five to 10 acre scale hazelnut orchard. Uh, so I'm going to step you through. There's a little bit of an art to getting it to work how you want. Um, and, and we'll talk a little bit about, about that as we go. So this machine itself is both a size sorting machine and a hazelnut shelling machine. So when you harvest hazelnuts from the field, um, depending on the cultivars and the mix of cultivars, the nuts will actually be a little bit different diameters. Uh, so to use this sheller efficiently, you want to be able to sort them by size uh, and then crack only one size at a time. Uh, so we're able to actually lift out the rollers and interchange them. And we have a whole set. We have about four different rollers that are differing by one millimeter size holes. And we essentially run the crop through this machine and start with the smallest and go all the way to the largest size and sort it. So if we have a thousand pounds of nuts, in the end, we'll have about five or six different size classes. And that sets us up uh, for shelling. This roller that's in here, um, at this point, you can see it has, has these half moon cutouts. And these actually are able to grab the hazelnut shells and allow the kernels to roll through. Uh, so it's a little different than the, than the round hole size sorter. This one can actually pull out the shells and we'll, we'll demonstrate that as we go. So this is actually the, the cracker itself here, sort of looks like an elongated sprocket. And this is turning towards a pressure plate, as you can see on the opposite side. And here's the pressure plate, which is basically just the door on the back side that you can adjust the depth of the distance between the door and that spinning gear. Uh, so the nuts get trapped and the gear is able to just spin the hazelnut and uh, find the right distance and shell it from that point. We wanted to mention that the company, Kianchia, that makes this machine actually makes a tabletop version. Now you'll be missing out on the shelling, so it's just going to crack the nuts and dump them into a pile or into a, a bowl or a bin. Um, but basically the same mechanism can be freestanding and sit on a table uh, with a very similar sized apparatus here. Uh, and you can shell your hazelnuts on an even smaller scale. Um, but then, of course, the challenge is taking the shells from the kernels and, and doing that. Um, and that's why this sort of ingenious simple tube here does such a, such a great job for us um, because we're able to remove probably 95 to 98 percent of the, the shells from the kernels. So as part of our operation uh, from harvesting, you did get a chance to see the harvesting machine. Um, that vacuums up a lot of in addition to hazelnuts, little stones, twigs, and other debris. Uh, so what we then do next is we take that basically field run hazelnut and all the debris, and we run it through this machine here, which then through a number of air blowers, essentially, and some in, in a paddle here machine or a paddle apparatus, it actually lifts off the light material, blows it out. Uh, the stones come out the bottom, so the heavy material doesn't get up in through the machine. And then any broken shells or twigs get pushed out here. And then also in the final stage, it's able to throw the hazelnuts up into an air column and separate out the blanks, which would be shells with no kernels versus the filled hazelnuts. So once it comes out the end here in this machine, uh, it's very clean and it's basically ready to go into the sheller 
uh, besides for size sorting. So this is sort of the intermediate step uh, between the field uh, and then the size sorting. Uh, but it does a great job of removing sticks and stones. And then, like I said, the, those blank hazelnut shells. So this machine does a really good job of re removing the shells, but it's not perfect. Um, so you will see that there's still a few shell pieces that need to be removed. And like any agricultural crop, you'll find ones that maybe an insect has fed on or are defective. Maybe they're shriveled, the tree didn't get enough moisture. Um, so before these go out and be roasted or consumed in any way, we have to do a quality sorting to remove the shells and any defective kernels. So at this point, we're, we're doing the, the quality sorting and it's a little bit, in our setup here, it's a little bit of a tedious job. Uh, I envision on like a commercial scale, it would be done differently uh, with the moving sorting table, uh, but we just process small batches. Uh, so what I have set up here are just some bins where I can to spread out the nuts so I can look at them closely. And then I just quickly go through and first run and pick out any obvious shell pieces. And then if I see any shriveled kernels or moldy kernels, uh, we wanna make sure that no end consumer gets these sort of rotten hazelnuts. Uh, so we'll go through and carefully uh, kind of discard any of the poor quality kernels. And uh, once you've done it for a long time, you start to get a good eye for how to do it. Uh, we do have a few insects like the brown marmorated stink bug that does feed on hazelnuts. And since we don't really spray for these insects, we will see some kernels that are pockmarked and we know that's from, from the stink bugs. But it's a small percentage, it's less than 10%, maybe it's only about 5%, uh, so that's uh, you know, very good. Most of what will happen with these kernels is they will be dry roasted uh, before they're used in making any, any food items or just eaten directly. Um, and what we recommend, and this is probably one of my favorite things to do with the hazelnuts, uh, is basically put them on a cookie sheet on a single layer in the oven uh, at about 325 degrees, maybe up to 350, depending on your oven, and then roast them for about 10 to 15 minutes, um, depending on your preferences. Do you like a darker roasted kernel or a lighter roasted kernel? Lighter roasted kernel. Um, and you'll actually see then at that point that the skin starts to pop off of the hazelnuts. Um, and then also, of course, your kitchen will be full with, filled with that special hazelnut roasting aroma, which is probably one of my favorite things. Um, but that, at that point allows that fibrous skin to peel off. Um, so what we then recommend is let those kernels cool, come to room temperature, and then using uh, your hands or a cloth, a terry cloth, like a towel, rub the kernels and remove as much as that, of that skin as you can. Um, and then you'll be left with mostly uh, pure white kernels uh, with, without the, the somewhat bit, bitter fibers on the outside, um, like you can see with these split kernels here. Um, and then they're ready for, as my kids like it, just eating directly once they're cool uh, or using in any products or making your, your hazelnut butters. Um, and of course that roasting process is part of that uh, sort of food safety process where that's essentially sterilizing those kernels. You bring them up to that high temperature. Uh, and then they're ready to eat. All right. So uh, again, the that video is actually it has another 10 minutes before what we just saw and it's it's really a lot more about um the, the growing uh we're out in the field you get to see you know what your what your alleys look like um and a whole lot more of that awesome uh ghostbusters vacuum machine <laughs> um so we um we do have a few questions we're gonna throw at you real quick um sure. Squirrels keep coming up. A lot of, whole lot of squirrels. How you done keep them squirrels away? Oh yeah, and also Tony, um, it came up this morning. The mite. The so mite. Tom, maybe you can talk about the 
the mite that is mite starting is to attack the hazelnuts trees. Was the that, mite? I don't. I think that was a different plant. That. Was uh, that don't tell me there's a new pest. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so the two the two big questions that came up in the the chat box over here. Um, one was was talking about um, squirrels. But then the other one, uh, what are the chances of new strains of blight overcoming the resistance that you might have uh, developed? Right, two, two very, very good, important questions. I'll, I'll talk about the squirrels first. Um, the, the challenge, that, that's going to be a big challenge. And, and if someone's not working, so there's two ways to avoid squirrels. One is to grow, if you have a large enough farm, grow the trees on in the interior of your farm so you have considerable space. Uh, you know, several hundred feet from your wood line and, and grow other low growing crops or mowed turfs or, or something to have that clearance from where the squirrels live and are going to come from. So then the hawks and fox and other things can kind of keep those populations down. Um, not everybody has that option. Um, I, I think you really, squirrels have to be part of like the pest control hunting measure if, if that's something that's acceptable to you on your farm. If you, if you live near a forest or if you live near the suburbs, um, there's gonna be a constant stream of squirrels each year and they will literally devastate your hazelnut planting. Um, they can eat, they eat them before they're ripe. So they eat them as sort of fresh fruit right on the tree. Um, and then they'll eat them all the way through till the fall. Um, it's, a, it's just a wonderful food source for everything. I mean, we found, so there's chipmunks, there's mice, there's squirrels, um, the raccoons will learn to eat your hazelnuts um, and they can eat a lot of hazelnuts, hundreds of pounds you can lose to raccoons. So it's kind of like you have to manage them. One way is, like I said, distance and it's also scale. So once you, if you have one acre of hazelnuts, you can literally lose every single nut from that, that acre. They will take everything um, because they start early and they just keep working. It's just, it's, it's 60% oil uh, and 20% and protein. I mean, that's something that the wildlife really loves. So um, squirrels have to be on your radar and you have to have some management plan for squirrels. Okay. Um, um, yeah, so well, get, your, get your BB gun out, I guess. Um, there, yeah, the, the, the big bud mite. Uh, okay. Sorry, Nagisa, I, I found that. That, that was the, the bug of concern was the big <laughs> bud mite. Now that is a concern. It is a concern in Oregon. Um, we we have it here in New Jersey. It's it's the pressure is very low. Um, some cultivars get it worse than others. The chemical control is something like a dormant oil spray once a season at the right time. So it's not. Um, there's many cultivars that are just very tolerant or resistant of it. Um, it's we would love to screen for it, but we really. We don't even have it in our plots in New Jersey. Okay. Um, I, I can find it, but it's just not, uh, whether it's climatic reasons or not, we just don't have it like the, I see it in the Pacific Northwest where it's, uh, it can be a big problem, um, but the, the, the amount of sprays you need for it are very limited. And if you grow the right cultivars, um, but like I said, the Rutgers cultivars, they come from supposed tolerant parents, but I'm not sure because we, we don't have the pressure. So that'll sort of unfold as it goes. Okay. Um, we definitely want to point out that you guys, uh, well, there's a big planting of your genetics at North Slope Farm. Um, and and Nagisa too, right? Nagisa, you've got some. Now, I so know. when I when I visited you, Tom, um, I remember you were saying there was one cultivar in particular that was kicking butt. Um, I feel like it was, am I, am I allowed to say it? Oh, sure. And I had some extra slides that, that pointed them all out, but we don't have to go to those. It's okay. Yeah, we're, we're, we're like right on the, the edge. It's two, three, four o'clock. Yeah. Uh, but the, was it the rar Raritan? Raritan is one that uh, is it just looking really great in terms of high yields. It's got a really good quality kernel. I mean, the, the original tree this year had 40, produced 42 pounds of nuts, which is really off the charts. We've been telling growers, uh, expect 10 to 15 pounds of nuts per tree. You plant 200 trees per acre, then you get your 2,000, you get your one ton of nuts and, you know, you're, that's a good, good yield. Um, but the Raritan tree is, is, is quite vigorous and, and productive. So we're excited about having that one out there for growers now. Um, do these guys breed true from seed uh, or do we need to, we need to be doing clonal? These are clones like apples, um, although 
because they're how they're produced, they're on their own roots. So these are like rooted cuttings essentially. But you do need to be aware of your orchard, the, the different plants you have in your orchard. So the pollen, they have the mix of pollenizers they need. Um, and I do, we do have a, I put a link in my presentation. Well, it's not, we have an extension bulletin that talks a little bit about that, but okay. they need to be cross pollinated. So you do have to make sure you have the right variety mix. Well, there's a lot going on and we can certainly post some of your material on our website. Um, I know and, we need to uh, go, but. And um, we're going to have to jump onto the thing. Yeah, go <laughs> ahead, Nagisa. You're the boss. I, hey, whatever. Think, no, no, no. It's like the, the, the 10 minutes we cut off is um, Tom's wonderful associate, John Capick, who is very helpful in um, to growers who are just getting started. He walked me through a very detailed 10 minute talk when he dropped off the trees at the farm. And we talked about them and he brought directions that are extraordinary and very helpful. If you follow those directions to the T, you'll just have, you know, so much better success. So I'll go ahead and post that on our site too. Yeah, we're, we're here to help. I mean, that's what we're, we're, you know, we're developing cultivars, but we're trying to help. So if anyone's inter interested, just can get, find my email online and get in touch with me. We'll, we'll accept, like Nagisa said, we have directions on getting started. And you can talk to us directly about what you want to do, and we'll help you through it. Awesome. Fantastic. Well, thank you. Sorry to rush you off, Tom. Uh, so everyone, we are going to take not a five-minute break, a three-minute break. So if you got to pee, get <laughs> out there. Fast. Make it quick. If you got to walk the dog, don't do it. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so hang, hang tight. Sorry we couldn't answer all the questions. But um, again, Tom and his team, are, are you can access them. And uh, I'm sure they'll be happy to answer some questions. Um, and I'm sure throughout the year, you know, follow up with Rutgers, they must, I wouldn't be surprised if they have some kind of uh, farm tour visit days. You know, they're all about education. It's oh, university. So um, next up uh, after our little quick pee break is going to be um, Mark Canwright uh, from Comeback Farm. And he's going to be focused on his orchards and his uh, apples and plums, and pears, oh my. So. All right, uh, we'll see you in a little bit. Sure. I mean, so in, in terms of the camera being at the right angle. Right. Right, owner operator of Comeback Farm, Hunterdon County, New Jersey. My farming career, my organic farming career, Comeback is an organic farm, began in 1974 when my father, uh, John Canwright, opened the first organic farm in the state of New Jersey in Somerset County, Farmer John's Organic Produce. 
I was his teenage assistant. For a long time, I was New Jersey's only second generation organic farmer. That's not the case anymore. Comeback Farm is a diversified organic vegetable and fruit farm. Uh, ownership, my ownership began here in 2003. So it's the second farm of my life. Uh, Comeback has the largest organic orchard in the state of New Jersey. 